This week, we learned that the manager of Japan's crippled Fukushima nuclear plant, Masao Yoshida, died from cancer. His illness reportedly had nothing to do with the radiation levels at the Fukushima plant that he worked in around the clock alongside a group of men referred to as the Fukushima 50, trying to contain the nuclear crisis in the days and months following the earthquake and tsunami. But although Mr. Yoshida's cancer can't be traced back to Fukushima, how many others in Japan may contract cancer in the future that can be traced back to Fukushima? On Tuesday, radioactive contamination of groundwater at the plant surged to levels 90 times greater than they were just three days ago. So what effect is the ongoing Fukushima nuclear crisis having in Japan? And what lessons should we be learning in the United States? Kevin Camps is here. He's the radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear. Kevin, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Sam. So let's start in Japan. What's the latest when it comes to Fukushima, when it comes to Japan, in the short term, as far as getting the situation under control, and then in the long term, when it comes to what sort of health effects we might see from, from all these dosages of radiation over the last few years? Well, the best word I can come up with for what's happening in recent days and weeks at Fukushima Daiichi is hemorrhaging of radioactivity. And the scariest part of all is that they don't know where it's coming from. But ultimately, it's coming from three melted down atomic reactor cores and severely damaged, if not entirely destroyed, radiological containment structures. That's where it's ultimately coming from. But why it's getting out now in such a hurry all of a sudden is the big mystery. And this is despite the fact that they have growing tank farms that are stretching now off-site kind of into the hillsides, holding just countless hundreds and thousands of tons of highly radioactively contaminated water, some of which we know are also leaking. So what it looks like is that this leakage at a faster rate or a slower rate has been going on for over two years at this point. And this really is a, a crisis that the world has never confronted before, this sort of nuclear crisis. I mean, we've had nuclear crisis, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island. This one at Fukushima is different. Um, so they're kind of flying by the seat of their pants trying to contain it. And here we are more than two years past it. And you say we have these tanks now being lined up. How long can this continue to go on? Uh, it seems like an impossible situation. And you know what Tokyo Electric has tried to get away with is convincing the government, the people in the area, the fishermen especially, that releasing some of the contents of those tanks might be an OK thing to do. And they haven't gotten away with it yet, intentionally releasing. But what's going on is unintentional. It's out of control, leakage pathways that they claim not to even know about. How much of the Fukushima disaster was caused, or at least made worse, by the design of the plant itself? And if that's the case, if it was made worse or caused by this, this design, should we in the United States be concerned because we have plants of similar designs? We have 23 identical designs to Fukushima Daiichi in the United States operating, including the oldest reactor in this country, Oyster Creek, New Jersey. We've now seen on live television two years ago what these things are capable of in terms of the explosions and the meltdowns. They knew as early as 1972 at the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission that this design of containment was too small and too weak, and yet they continued to license these things. And we've lived with a game of uh, Russian roulette in terms of the safety risks for 40, dec for 40 years now. These are also building designs that include putting these waste pools at the top of the building, which has proven to be a pretty big problem in the cleanup at Fukushima. That's the other shoe that we hope will never drop, but it's, it's precarious at this point. Unit 4 at Fukushima Daiichi could collapse if there's another big earthquake, and the cooling water in that high-level radioactive waste storage pool could be lost suddenly. Within hours, that waste could be on fire. The situation in the U.S. is that we have uh, multiple times more waste in our pools than is contained in Unit 4, and they are vulnerable to various natural disasters or terrorist attacks or accidental drops of heavy loads that could drain the water away. Or potentially earthquakes and, yes. and other natural disasters. I mean, Fukushima, yeah. that was caused by an earthquake and, and a tsunami that came through. Um, how many plants in the United States are in similar precarious situations on fault lines or on coasts or near flood flooding zones. I think we had one, uh, I forgot what state it was last year, that came dangerously close to being flooded. Well, uh, Fort Calhoun in yeah. Nebraska has now been shut down for over two years uh, since uh, April of 2011 because of the flooding out there, the damage that was done to the underground facilities. And just like in Japan, 
we are looking at the uh, imminent restart of that reactor despite the damage done, and they don't know how bad it is underground. So in Japan, they're trying to restart reactors despite Fukushima Daiichi. We have dozens, scores of reactors in various vulnerable situations to natural disasters. We did recently move to have reactors shut down at the San Onofre uh, nuclear facility uh, last month. How much of that was, do you think was influenced by what we saw happening in Fukushima, um, if at all? Or is this just kind of a one-off, here we are being careful about nuclear power in this instance while letting all these plants continue un, you know, relatively unchecked in dangerous areas? Well, there has been a groundswell of concern among the American public post-Fukushima, because now folks have seen on live television what American reactor designs are capable of. But I should hasten to say that there are watchdogs in California who have been in the trenches for four decades out there watchdogging San Onofre. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was not the one who shut down San Onofre. It was the utility itself. The NRC was doing all it could to keep this utility viable. But it was the intervention of groups like Friends of the Earth and grassroots groups who just shined a very bright spotlight on the damage at that facility and showed that it was dangerous to 8 million people if they ever restarted that thing. Uh, in the last 10, 15 seconds, what has Fukushima done for the movement to, for the no nukes movement? Well, I think, you know, the fallout that hit the United States that is still going into the ocean has shown people that the food is contaminated to an extent and uh, people have to be careful what they're eating and people are getting involved on the local level the nukes in their neighborhood, they're, they're fighting to shut them down. Right. Kevin Camps, the radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear, thank you so much. Thank you.